Welcome to the Wall Street Journal debate on volatility as the new normal in conjunction with the World Economic Forum. Nowadays, you don't have to look very far, even if you're not a Wall Street trader, to see the real world effects of volatility in financial markets. Anybody who's filled up their car in the US recently will have noticed just how much cheaper it's got after an amazing 56% collapse in the oil price since last summer. And for those delegates who haven't been out for drinks in Davos yet, and Switzerland was never cheap, let's face it, brace yourself for the impact of the Swiss central bank abandoning its currency ceiling. At one stage on Thursday, the franc soared 30% in a matter of minutes against the euro. Good afternoon, my name is Thorold Barker from the Wall Street Journal, and I'm delighted to welcome our fantastic panel from around the world to discuss this increasingly important issue. Zhou Shashuan is the longest serving, serving governor of the People's Bank of China, having been appointed in 2002. And he's been a leading figure in policy circles since China started opening its economy to the world. Apart from navigating the global financial crisis, Governor Zhou has pushed to rebalance the Chinese economy away from investment towards consumption and championed a more freely traded international renminbi. Guillermo Ortiz was finance minister of Mexico and then central bank governor. And he has plenty of experience of volatility, having lived through the tequila crisis of 1994 and 1995. So hopefully he will share some anecdotes from that. He's currently chairman of the advisory board of Banorte, one of the country's leading banks. Arkady Dvorkovich is deputy prime minister of the Russian Federation. A Western trained economist who studied at Duke University, he's held a number of policy positions in recent years and currently oversees industry, the energy sector, agriculture, IT, telecommunications, and I think a few more things, but that will keep you busy for the time being. Anthony Scaramucci worked in finan or has worked in financial markets for 25 years in New York, including stints at Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. He founded Skybridge Capital in 2005, an alternative asset manager with $13 billion under management. And he also hosts the high profile SALT investment conference for hedge funds every spring in Las Vegas. And finally, Ken Rogoff, Thomas Cabot Professor of Public Policy and Professor of Economics at Harvard University. He's author of the best-selling and sometimes controversial book, along with Carmen Reinhardt, This Time It's Different, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. For good measure, he's also a chess grand master. So please join me in welcoming this distinguished panel. <clears throat> So to kick off with, <clears throat> I'm going to each, each, ask each of the panelists with their very different perspectives to tell us very briefly what they see as the biggest sources of volatility for the coming year and the risks that that will create. So I'll start with Governor Joe. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, 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 this is, uh, I think, uh, important and difficult questions. Uh, the volatility in the financial market uh, sometimes, uh, you know, changes from time to time. Uh, I remember uh, a half years ago, uh, central bankers uh, uh, sit together to talk about why the volatility was so low. Uh, that's, uh, uh, they may say that uh, the market participant had uh, a less uh, risk appetite. Uh, but suddenly, the uh, situation changed. So I think uh, probably it's related uh, uh, first uh, the concern of uh, uh, international situation, especially uh, geopolitical situation. Yeah, uh, people don't know that, uh, uh, what kind of uh, development uh, it goes. Uh, the second, I think that uh, uh, we really have a, a volatility at this time uh, in uh, financial market and commodity market. Uh, I think it's still a big question that uh, uh, for the coming uh, months, uh, how uh, uh, it's uh, developed. Uh, I think third, uh, 
uh, concern is that uh, along with uh, QE exit, that uh, whether there uh, may be uh, some of the irregular capital uh, inflow and outflow uh, around the world, uh, we remember, we still remember that uh, uh, in the summer time of uh, 2013, the, there are some of uh, irregular capital flows from emerging market. So emerging market, financial market uh, participants, uh, yeah, uh, try to look at this kind of uncertainty and uh, uh, it's maybe also a source of volatility. Thank you. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mr. Ortiz. <coughs> well, I think that, um, you know, following on Shishuan's comments, um, <coughs> obviously, a, I mean, th there is a an increase in, uh, let's say, overlaying of uncertainty, uh, <clears throat> which begets volatility, and that's caused, you know, by obviously the fall in oil prices, the, by the divergence of uh, monetary policy among major banks. You just mentioned uh, the move of the Swiss National Bank uh, last week. Uh, you have uh, geopolitical risk and some <clears throat> kind of fussy. Uh, th this is something normal, you know. I mean, you have this mixed current of data coming from the world, uh, which people, you know, have difficulty figuring out. And this goes to the background of sort of more structural issues, you know, in, in terms of uh, inflation or risk of, of deflation and economic growth in general. Mm -hmm. uh, this mixed with uh, the sort of, you know, modern technology of trading platforms and so on. Uh, it just keeps adding layers of risk, uh, which begets uncertainty, and that obviously causes volatility. You know? And as uh, Shijuan was saying, uh, uh, you know, uh, at a point, uh, you know, central banks were suppressing actually volatility until they could not do it any longer. And, uh, you know, central banks are not in the business uh, of, uh, you know, suppressing or reducing volatility. They're in the business of conducting monetary policy. But as a byproduct of that, you know, uh, then you uh, get all these cross currents that I just mentioned. Great. Yeah. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Vokovic, you have obviously, your country's been through a lot of volatility recently, so it'd be great to hear your, your perspective on Thank this. Thank you. Uh, well, I also went through uh, a few crises already. <laughs> uh, 98, 99, uh, 2008, 2009, now another uh, one. And uh, probably <clears throat> you uh, would expect me to say that oil is a major uh, thing, uh, as, uh, as I'm coming from <clears throat> Russia. It is not. I think the uh, more important thing, uh, and volatility is a uh, function of uncertainty, uh, the most uncertainty comes from, uh, from the policies, from the government policies around the world. The most uncertain thing is now how the US government will behave, how European governments uh, in the European Com uh, Commission, European Central Bank uh, will behave. Some people will uh, say that uh, uh, they don't know how the Russian government will uh, behave. Uh, the un intransparency and uncertainty about government policies is uh, uh, one of the major volatility f uh, factors now around the world. And uh, oil price is a function of that. Uh, I don't think that oil price here is an independent, uh, an independent factor. Uh, uh, and uh, we know what, is equili what equilibrium price uh, is now. Uh, Everybody knows, actually. Uh, but uh, uh, oil price can be both higher and lower than, uh, than equilibrium. Equilibrium price, everybody knows? Of course, everybody, everybody knows. But, uh, uh, it, that, that's news to me. <laughs> of course, everybody knows. But uh, not, not everyone is interested in reaching this right. equilibrium. It is about interests. Uh, at the end, we will come to that level. Uh, but uh, right now, there are some countries, some forces around the world that are not really interested in getting to this level immediately. Okay. Mm -hmm. After some period, yes, but not immediately. Fantastic. And so when you talk about governments, you mean the Saudi government as well and those policies? The oil market, set. yes, Saudi government <coughs> as well. Uh, Great. Has its own interests, uh, mixed domestic and uh, um, uh, global, and the structure of the market is important, uh, it's clear. Uh, but also, also what is important is a uh, uh, combination of domestic interests uh, and 
global political interests uh, for major uh, countries like United States, European governments, uh, uh, China, of course, and uh, uh, Russia is also uh, in that circle. Uh, and sometimes, unfortunately, governments are not taking right decisions before the short-term political uh, interests domestically. Uh, and this uh, adds to the uncertainty that we have now. Great, thank you. Mr. Skarmich. Well, yeah, just to put some context on this, if we were here in 2009, uh, we didn't have the interventionary governmental forces that have been in play over the last six years. Uh, but if you now look today, and let's say someone was writing an economic history of our time 50 years from now, uh, they would be saying that this was the age of major governmental interventionary forces. Uh, the first stage of that was depression of monetary policy, depression of interest rates that created a tremendous amount of low volatility. We're now about to enter the second stage of that, uh, where uh, they're going to ease up on the monetary policy, and then other things are going to start to happen. Now, what we've learned in the last five or six years is that each government is going to use its own arsenal or its own capability. If it's the United States and its monetary and military policy, uh, the Saudi government is using oil tariff policy. See, and so every government's going to be in there. Um, I'm sure China, Russia will have things that they're going to do. The EU is doing the same. Uh, and so as an investor, uh, you now have to calculate governments intervening in the markets, which are going to create huge unexpected volatility turns. Uh, the age of the low volatility is over, uh, and we're now to, about to enter that new e epoch. It's going to be very bad for the macro manager, hedge fund manager, and certainly very bad for long short managers because the rules have completely changed. Uh, Professor Rogan, <clears throat> if you could um, bring all that together with your perspective, which is a very global one. Well, I want to separate market volatility from volatility in the macro economy. If we're talking about market volatility, certainly the central bank policy is very hard for them to understand, much less for the markets to understand, and uh, we're very much in unknown territory. I think if we're talking about, you know, bigger things in the global economy that sort of affect the arc of volatility, uh, the transition in China from being, uh, you know, investment export driven to more consumption driven is a huge change. And that has been playing out in many places. I think oil, partly that story, low exports in Germany, commodity prices. Uh, uh, Governor Zhou mentioned uh, geopolitics and uh, certainly they're uh, in the mix. Although I have to say, I find when I, I'm talking about geopolitics being the risk, I tend to think we must not have much going on because it's always there, some form of geopolitics. Um, clearly, Europe is a, a risk. I, I, I can't really uh, uh, tell if um, you know, it's, it's just that you might have an election in Spain or somewhere that just changes the whole dynamic or whether it's not really that it's a risk, it's just a depressing certainty. I'm not really sure where I stand between those two things. And, and I think oil's been mentioned. That certainly mirrors a lot of the uncertainties, the heightened volatility. Um, I, I don't know what the equilibrium price of oil is. I think it's actually very hard to say uh, whether you know it's going way back up, whether it can go down further. Uh, I don't know, but it's it clearly mirroring quite, mirroring quite a bit of volatility in the economy. <clears throat> so can we, um, to uh, Mr. Scaramucci's point, can we start with central banks? Um, we've got the European Central Bank meeting tomorrow, um, and it's widely expected they will launch um, full quantitative easing. It's unclear how much yeah. and exactly the form of that. Um, but that's taking place while the uh, central bank in Japan is still being very aggressive and while the, U the U.S. central bank, the Fed, is beginning to pull back and looking to actually raise interest rates. Um, what does that mean from a markets perspective and from an economic perspective, uh, Professor Rogoff, in terms of the potential for that to cause dislocations as people begin to, <clears throat> to find that what was eminently predictable over the last few years has suddenly become quite unpredictable? Well, I mean, I think obviously it will. Um, we don't have a lot of history with something at quite this degree of interest rates all coming down to record lows everywhere at every horizon. And what happens if uh, central banks actually start persuading people that, yes, we can inflate. Yes, we can restore inflation to normal. 
and it, you, the markets should be prepared for it, but they're probably they're probably not. Um, on on the other hand, uh, I suspect that uh, the larger picture is the divergences between the two central banks, where. Um, and it might not be so much the Fed raising interest rates as Europe and Japan doing more and more dramatic things to try to ease monetary policy. And what do you think, <clears throat> um, Mr. Ortiz, what do you think that impact is from a, um, an economic perspective globally? Do you think that that will have a big dampening effect on economies around the world, or is that going to be more of a financial market implication? I think it's going to be both, you know. Um, obviously... <clears throat> I mean, as, as Kenneth was saying, I mean, we are on, on, in our uncharted waters. And Mr. Scaramucci said, you know, the last few years have been, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, played by huge government intervention. <clears throat> but we have to ask ourselves why. I mean, what happened before the financial crisis when there was no intervention? And it was precisely, you know, this lax feeling, you know, that markets uh, could allocate resources and manage risk well, that led us to uh, the place we're today. And, uh, you know, central yeah, banks. I, I don't want to interrupt, but I actually disagree with that because yeah. if you look at the United States, we've had a policy in the United States to promote housing. And so what they did was they forced a lot of people into these subprime well, houses that they couldn't exactly, afford it. So I mean, and why the, was the governments are always there, sir. No, That's the but thing. why was way that? There, way there more now than before. Why was that? Because there was a sensation, you know, that uh, markets not better, and the government policy was to, you know, provide housing or whatever. whatever. I mean, I don't want to go into this, <clears throat> but it is, you know, as Ken was saying, the divergence of central banks which is putting a, uh, a huge degree of, of uh, uncertainty on the whole thing, you know. The U.S. is in, about to normalize monetary policy. We're expecting huge QE uh, tomorrow from the European Central Bank. Uh, it is very difficult to think that uh, Japan will reach the 2% inflation rate. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, Japan's Central Bank is likely to embark in a new round of uh, of easing policy, and this whole combination, I mean, this combination of things, obviously, is adding layers. Uh, and uh, this has, you know, profound implications, not only for financial markets. And in, in, in terms of financial markets, what we should be very worried about is correlation, not so much volatility, well, volatility, obviously, but, you know, particularly correlation <coughs> among asset classes. Yeah, but Mr. Scarman, do you think that asset prices are detached from fundamentals? I mean, do you think that the interventions I, have caused that to occur, well, and hence the ability for, say, some, another Swiss franc event to occur yeah, is much more prices, significant? Some asset prices are detached, but in a, in a period of low interest rates, what we know in financial markets is that interest rates are the gravity in financial asset markets. The lower the rates, the more valuable the assets become. I think what's scaring everybody is that if you were here a year ago, people predicted that rates were going to go higher. But if you were looking and really doing the work, you knew that rates were going lower because we are in the age of oversupply. Uh, Dr. Rogoff and I were talking about that in the green room. We have two and a half billion people that are now onboarding themselves into the Western style capitalist experience. It's not just in China and it's not just in India. It's parts of Africa. It's Latin America. And this is having a major consequential effect that no macroeconomist and no policy theorist, Dr. Bernanke, nobody has gotten ahead of. Uh, and so we're way behind this thing. The United States did a better job, frankly. I'm not just saying that because I'm American, but they got ahead of it a little. Uh, the Europeans are way behind. Uh, the Japanese have had fits and starts for 25 years. But you are in a deflationary age. And if we get deflation, the average citizen in the world does not understand the consequences of what deflation is, and it's an annihilation. It's the Darth Vader Death Star outside of the atmosphere of the Earth shooting a laser to blow up the world's economy. But that's kind of dramatic. <laughs> plus that, I mean, I, I think that it's been, it's been good for that's everybody, uh, you know, on, on the whole. But it and could the central bank. Hang on, hang on. The fact that you think it's unlikely Anthony, to happen Anthony, means Anthony, it's more likely. Anthony, one second. Likely. Can you let Professor Robert yeah, just sorry. come in there? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I think that. I love your enthusiasm. Please, keep it. <laughs> <laughs> just getting started. <laughs> no, I mean, I think the two and a half billion 
three billion people coming into the labor force is fantastic. It's been lifted people out of poverty, and you know the whole talk about the world becoming less equal. I think if you treat every citizen in the world the same, there's never been a period where it's be becoming more equal. It's been good, but it's put a lot of political pressures in the advanced economies. I, on, on central banks, I think they've been a little surprised that they have trouble creating inflation. I don't think they knew that. And frankly, since this summer especially, the markets have lost confidence that they'll ever do it. You even look five years, 10 years out, and it used to be, OK, you say 2%, 2%, but you're, we know you're going to cheat, maybe. And so the expectation would be 3 or percent or even a little north of that. And now, you know, it's coming down to 2% in Europe, well below 2%. We just don't believe you that you're going to do it. That's, that's quite a dramatic change. And do you think the markets are right to believe that? Because everything is now priced on the assumption that that won't happen. Well, do you think there's any chance that there'll be a well, major central surprise? bankers maybe, here and investors, maybe, but maybe I don't. Some, maybe central, it's not a problem of central banks, you know. Uh, I mean, I think it's very difficult, for, for, for example, for the European Central Bank or for, for Japan to actually get to their 2% inflation target. You know, we are <clears throat> looking at this against the background of ever slowing growth. I mean, the IMF just lowered uh, growth perspectives, and this has been going on. Well, let's talk for to someone who's years. got a lot of growth in his country still at the moment, which is yeah. slowing, but is still at 7.4%. Um, yeah. I mean, how do you think of China has been frankly, uh, in some ways, a bastion of stability through this process. It's continued to grow uh, quite significantly. And up until now, the markets have been um, in decent shape. But now you're seeing the housing market slowing significantly. And you're seeing a stock market which has rallied incredibly aggressively last year, up about 53%, and fell 7.7% just in the last few days based on a small regulatory change on, um, on margin. I mean, how do you approach this yourself as the economy slows, as a central banker, thinking about how you manage this whole process? Uh, uh, be before uh, answering uh, your question, uh, can I comment on this uh, previous uh, Please. <laughs> issue? Of this? Uh, uh, I would like uh, to distinguish uh, that, uh, the concept of uh, uh, government intervention or central bank intervention and uh, the concept of uh, uh, counter-cyclical. Uh, adjustment of monetary policy. Uh, if uh, central bank see uh, the cyclical changes uh, of uh, economic growth, uh, the job creation, so surely the uh, central bank, uh, uh, we may have a counter-cyclical response and to have a policy adjustment. Uh, it doesn't, does not mean uh, that uh, uh, any uh, uh, intensive uh, uh, intervention to that. Uh, uh, but we know that uh, among the central bankers, uh, some uh, uh, bank, uh, central bankers believe the counter-cyclic uh, 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 policy adjustment, but some others uh, don't uh, very much believe that. Mm -hmm. So they, they may have a different uh, policy uh, yeah, stand. Uh, so I say that uh, uh, if uh, uh, central bank uh, do have a counter-cyclic uh, policy adjustment, uh, it, uh, uh, whether it can uh, bring the inflation to the 2% uh, uh, target or not, it's still uncertain because the economy uh, may have the other problem, the structure problem, the labor market problem. Uh, the too low growth rate or, or the other things. So uh, I agree with uh, the central bank governor, uh, Mario Draghi. Uh, I think uh, uh, Governor Kloda says that uh, the monetary policy uh, may create a room, a time period, for the other structural policies to come out, uh, to implement, to, uh, yeah, to do a good job. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, the monetary policy uh, is not uh, a panacea uh, to, uh, yeah, to really reach uh, that, uh, uh, the target people ex expected. Uh, but I think that uh, this kind of uh, central bank policy adjustment, uh, I think, anyway, is uh, useful. Uh, for China, I think your question, I think, is right. That's, uh, 
Uh, basically, China still keep uh, uh, that's uh, relatively high growth rate. So the last year was 7.4%, uh, uh, but we had some of uh, uh, also cyclical movement. Uh, typical things is uh, uh, the residential uh, housing market. So, uh, people, uh, yeah, China is a very large country, so we have uh, so many. Uh, uh, cities, so uh, they may uh, perform very differently. So uh, somewhere they have uh, oversupply. Some somewhere uh, in some city uh, it's uh, it's a still uh, that's uh, over demand. Uh, so, but uh, generally, uh, yeah, yeah, we see that there may be a cyclical uh, adjustment. Uh, for the central bank. Uh, uh, we, uh, I think that's basically the, the keep monetary policy uh, uh, stable, yeah, because this is not a nationwide serious problem. For the, for the asset uh, market, I think that uh, we may have an impact of international commodity uh, uh, markets uh, to the domestic market. So people, um, uh, the market participants may be very nervous to watch uh, about the big Chinese oil companies uh, or th those uh, companies related to the, to the commodity, the steel mills or the others. So uh, I think general, uh, uh, general uh, uh, feeling uh, for the market participants is that uh, they fear the uncertainty. Uh, they are a little bit nervous. Sometimes they may have uh, overreactions. Uh, so it may enlarge the volatilities. Uh, but basically, I think it's, uh, it's uh, still uh, stable. Uh, Chinese uh, uh, stock market. Uh, but just, just before, down, before you go into the stock market, just on yeah. the real estate market, I mean, real how estate. concerned mm. Are you, and would you, like some other central banks, explicitly, if the, if the property market did fall significantly, how much would you actually explicitly try and target that and stabilize that as a central bank in China? Uh, that's, uh, you know, generally, if uh, uh, the, the aggregate uh, uh, indicator of Chinese economy is okay, so we, uh, uh, central bank, uh, uh, are difficult to have a specific policy. Uh, directed to uh, the real estate market. Uh, but however, uh, yeah, uh, you know that uh, we can have uh, some of the so-called macroprudential policies, including loan to value ratios, uh, including some of uh, uh, yeah, special government program to support uh, uh, those uh, of uh, uh, the old, ci old city uh, re reconstructions. So uh, not very much, but uh, we try to uh, do uh, uh, some things uh, uh, counter-cyclic and uh, to use a macroprudential instrument. And, on, but, and then going back to stocks, are you concerned that some of the policies you started to do to address the slowing economy will push more money into stocks and create a bubble in stocks that becomes destabilizing? Uh, uh, there, there is always uh, the, the possibility that uh, 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 the central banks, uh, I think, in China, yeah, we try to uh, manage it to have a relatively stable uh, money supply, not too much liquidity uh, into the economy. But uh, the economy changes from time to time. Sometimes it's because of international uh, financial market situation. So the liquidity uh, in the Chinese financial market changes from time, time to time. So sometimes central bank withdraw the liquidity, sometimes inject the, the liquidity. Uh, so uh, certainly it may have some of impact to the asset market, including stock market. Uh, but uh, I think that. Uh, the stock market participants uh, should mainly uh, focus more on uh, the fundamentals of those of listed companies. Okay. Uh, so you had a, a point to make, or yes, I was uh, going to ask you a question. Just, but just three, three small points. Uh, first, uh, if you uh, if you need to know how to get to higher inflation, come to Russia. We know how to <laughs> produce higher inflation. What's your secret? <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we bring you to uh, the United States or Japan or Europe? Well, that's kind of, well, this, well, there are no secrets. Well, actually, inflation is a problem for Russia, of course. We have ex extreme inflation, and uh, we need to reduce it. But uh, 
Uh, and it comes to, uh, to the demand for money, basically. And uh, uh, if uh, businesses, people trust into central bank policy, uh, then they produce higher demand for money, inflation go, uh, goes down. Uh, if there is no real trust in the policy, then inflation will go up whatever you, uh, whatever you do, since there is no real demand for, uh, for um, domestic uh, uh, currency. Uh, but uh, I think Europe is already too late. Uh, I remember the session last year in Davos when we discussed uh, whether Europe uh, has to uh, ease monetary policy or not. And most people were saying, yes, Europe has to do it already. Right. Uh, we have, uh, uh, one year passed, uh, yeah. no steps have been made, basically. We uh, Europe, is very, Europe is very late, and uh, I think uh, all uh, now believe that Europe should make uh, certain steps. And American policies were very uh, smart in this regard. I think uh, uh, even if you take uh, uh, a part that we don't like, sanctions against Russia, sanctions, uh, sanctions that the United States uh, introduced against Russia also work against Europe and work heavily already. Some of the European banks are saying that uh, because of the sanctions against Russia, we are losing competitiveness against American banks. Since American banks uh, uh, know, uh, well, they can call to, to the State Department task uh, whether we are allowed to give loans or finance uh, certain projects. European banks uh, do not know anything about this. They are uh, they're taking risks of uh, financing any, any specific project. And uh, regulations that have been adopted in the United States towards uh, transparency of banks uh, also led to the um, uh, degrading of um, European banks' uh, competitiveness. And the third point, uh, and I think uh, uh, I read this uh, in one of the um, Mr. Rubini's uh, articles, is the uh, relation between um, uh, monetary policy and uh, uh, macroprudential regulations. Uh, what he is saying, and I think he's right, uh, that, uh, well, you can use monetary policy to um, uh, to uh, produce a uh, better situation uh, in, uh, in your economy and uh, to uh, change uh, uh, interest rates. Uh, but then uh, you come to the situation where you risk with uh, uh, bubbles, uh, with asset bubbles. Uh, and uh, uh, the only instrument that was mentioned uh, uh, by our Chinese uh, friend uh, is macroprudential regulation. You can use some of the instruments to alleviate pressure in the asset market. Uh, but, uh, well, in Chinese system, you can do it, since you are very efficient doing this. I'm not sure that you are able to do this in Europe, since uh, those instruments were uh, highly inefficient uh, in Europe, and you saw bubbles rising uh, uh, despite the uh, instruments uh, being used uh, by uh, by central bank, both in the financial market and in the banking uh, sector. So I think uh, while easing uh, central bank, uh, European central bank and national governments should be very careful about not creating new bubbles um, in the upcoming period. Okay, and do you think there's a risk that the um, the ECB and its quantitative easing, we don't know what it'll do yet, but that that actually <clears throat> much more pushes asset markets rather than actually addressing the underlying economy of Europe, Professor Robert? Well, I think it has driven the exchange rate down. If they don't do it, the exchange rate will but go But I'm thinking back stocks up. as well. I mean, there's <clears throat> obviously... I, I mean, I think that the nature of it is not a big enough qualitative change, frankly, to really push inflation up. I think the problem's been that they don't control inflation perfectly, and it's very volatile, but markets get the sense that there's a ceiling at 2%. I mean, even the Fed, when it put bounds on it, it's at 2.5% when it's willing to go, you know, allows inflation to go much lower. So I, I think to get out of this, ultimately, the central banks need to communicate that they're willing to be much more symmetric at a minimum. And if inflation's been really low for a long time, they're okay with it being higher. They have not been willing to say that. And I think that's necessary, not just quantitative easing for this to work. Right, but that comes all back to communication. And one of the big challenges has been that they've made a lot of promises, and we saw this in Switzerland, that ultimately sometimes you can fulfill and sometimes <laughs> you can't fulfill. And I think you know, as we get to the end of forward guidance and some of these things, that presumably has a large opportunity to create instability. I mean, I wouldn't draw a parallel with Switzerland and the other things. This was a very unusual thing. It's very hard to fix your exchange rate and have an so open So that just shouldn't market. have been done in the first place? Well, I don't know. You know, you shouldn't have expected it to last forever. Okay. <clears throat> Well, you know, just talking about this um, issue of communications and, and central banks, it's, it's a complicated one. I mean, the Fed has said that um, policy actions are data dependent. You know, and, and what does that mean? 
local markets. You know, it doesn't really mean a lot in the sense that everybody interprets that uh, differently. So uh, <clears throat> the markets, market participants are watching the Fed. The Fed is watching the markets. And the uh, participants are watching each other. So there's a lot of second guessing on this. And <clears throat> I'm not sure whether you know, this forward guidance provide you know, anything that, that can clarify uh, sentiment and that would produce uh, a reduction, let's say, in, in volatility going forward. You know? And okay. particularly given the divergence that we're seeing central banks. And this is something that, just, just to finish, you know, uh, when we uh, had the great crisis, we had the, you know, the coordination of central banks. I mean, the initial response was pretty and now coordinated. now they're going in different directions. And now, you know, yep. everybody is going its own way. <laughs> and ultimately, I mean, and no one has mentioned this, is that there is absolutely no global coordination. Right. That's a fair no point. global That's coordination. A good point. I mean, so. Uh, so before I just want to go back to Russia, but yeah. just Anthony has a quick thought. No, just for the, the the elephant in the room that none of us are addressing, is the excess cash on the balance sheet of the S and P 500 in the United States. There's over two trillion dollars of cash on the balance sheet. Um, the current administration. I'm not saying they're not pro business. They certainly feel, and they would say that they are. But I think there's a perception that they're not. And there's been a lot of cash hoarding at the S&P 500 level. Mm -hmm. And so my prediction is that we're going to get better than expected growth. A lot growth. of that is due to tax, overseas tax. That, that, that's, that's as well. And so the prediction here is that the next American president, whoever it may be, will be a very successful one because that balance sheet is going to be reduced. The cash is going to get invested. And it's going to surprise the world the amount of growth that's going to come not only out of the United States, but the rest of the world. So what we like to do is we think linearly, and we expect that there's going to be very slow growth for a very long period of time. Uh, but this is the ghost in the machine that could happen to us in two or three years uh, that unleashes uh, growth. And now the Federal Reserve will be working the other way to try to tame inflation. And that's the irony of the whole thing. So what would that mean, just to, to follow that, if, if people are surprise when it comes to interest rates and deflation and it actually turns out to be much better than people think, there's going to be a lot of dislocations if people start valuing yeah. assets off 4% risk-free rates instead of 1.8. There'll, there'll or, be a lot of dislocations and I think the central theme and the point that I was trying to make to our audience is that the governmental intervention is with us to stay uh, and it's coming not only from the United States, China, Europe, Saudi Arabia, it's coming from the world. Uh, and they're now players in the marketplace, they're going to create a lot more volatility and a lot more unexpected things to happen. And you've got to get defensive and you've got to think about it from that perspective as an investor. OK, well, we'll go on to the, the imp impacts in a minute. But just going back to Russia quickly, you're living with a lot of volatility in the ruble and the oil price at the moment. Um, I was interested to hear you say it's not the oil price, it's the geopolitics, it's the biggest issue for Russia. Can you just expand on that a little bit more? Um, is that when it comes to foreign investment drying up? Is that the banking system, the sanctions? I mean, just give me a sense of exactly what's hitting where in the economy and what Russia's going to do about that, given that geopolitics have two sides to each equation. Well, oil price uh, is an issue for, uh, for us, certainly. But uh, what we decided a few years ago, we decided to, um, uh, to uh, establish a macroeconomic framework where uh, dependence on oil price is lower than before. So we uh, are... Um, putting together the budget uh, under the lower price assumption um, than the actual price. It's not the case uh, this year, since nobody expected oil prices to go down so sharply. Uh, but as a rule, we did this way. We accumulated reserves okay. uh, to be used when oil prices are low. And this is exactly what we are doing But they've been uh, used now. to support the banking system, haven't they? Which is uh, a separate no, issue. We, we use uh, those reserve, uh, reserves uh, uh, for the priorities we believe are the most important. Uh, uh, this quarter of 2015, we decided that banking sector stability is a key. 
This is why we decided to put some of uh, the funds to recapitalize uh, the banking system. But for the year, uh, year as a whole, we will use some part of the reserves uh, for fiscal stability purposes. We will cut some of the expenses, but we are not going to cut uh, our budget by, mm, by two, twofold. We are going to cut by 10, maybe 15 percent, uh, 10 percent most, most likely. And we cover uh, the rest of the deficit with some of the reserves we have been accumulating for uh, years. Uh, and uh, this is why oil prices are not as important for now uh, as uh, before. We but if you, look at geo, if you look at geopolitics, I mean, you have a fairly yeah. embedded situation with sanctions at the moment, given the conflict in, in, the, in Ukraine and obviously the an, annexation of Crimea. What is the, what's going to change there? Or are you just destined to have that continued volatility no. around that situation? Well, the, the most... Uh, uh, Mm, a risky situation is when you don't know where oil prices are, uh, are going. But it's clear that they're not going to minus 40. There is some level where oil price will stop. And we just need to... Uh, we just need One to would hope, yeah. And, uh, we just need, just to, just we just, we just need to, uh, to find this, uh, uh, this level. And at some point, and no, it's not far away. Uh, it's already close. Right, but Russia we, can we, live with the current situation of the ruble. The most important for us uh, is... Uh, uh, to stabilize uh, the oil market at some point, since otherwise people don't know what to expect uh, uh, in the currency market. Uh, let's say the oil prices are 40, then people know that uh, the exchange rate will maybe devalue a little bit more from the uh, today's level and stop. And then we will uh, be able to reduce interest rates uh, domestically and start doing normal business. Since uh, uh, with the current interest rates of 17%, uh, the key rate of the central bank, it is impossible to do any business in the uh, economy. And people are just waiting before the situation will stabilize. And uh, yes, right now it's a major uh, volatility uh, factor, uh, but it's not going to last for long. And if sanctions continue as they are, the banking system and all of that important financing, that will be in your view, sustainable in, in the current situation? Well, with, with sanctions present, we just need to find uh, different ways to stimulate the economy. We uh, have to put more attention on institutional changes, creating better business environment, uh, and uh, uh, prioritizing uh, import substitution and export support, given the competence level we have now with lower uh, ruble. So we will just change focus a little bit, change priorities, and do things that are more important for the economy right now. So even with sanctions, uh, we'll have a uh, good uh, basis uh, to continue growth. For some period, the economy will slide, uh, but uh, it's not going to last forever, even with sanctions. We'll find basis to start growing again. Okay. Can I ask him a question, though? What, what, is, the, what is the best scenario for Russia in terms of the sanctions and the oil price? Well, sa sanctions overall are stupid. Since sanctions are, uh, I'm, 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 double, I'm trying to let you get yeah, it out there. Yeah, yeah, double H. The best scenario for everyone is to sanction, uh, for sanctions to be lifted. And then, so of where course, do you think uh, the oil prices should be? <laughs> well, well, you're asking me about equilibrium, uh, equilibrium no, that I, I know yeah, about. I'm asking what's the best <laughs> for Russia? Well, you know, let's uh, this uh, afterwards because I'm not sure that we control all the prices. The best, the best scenario for Russia is uh, stable prices. Stable prices. Uh, and uh, if prices will be stable between 6 and 80, uh, it's much better than prices are uh, 110 now and 40 uh, tomorrow. Uh, so we have to look at the best scenario for Russia. Well, you know, I'm asking what's the best scenario for Russia? Well, you know, I'm asking what's the best scenario for Russia? Well, you know, I'm asking what's the best scenario for Russia? Well, you know, I'm asking what's the best scenario for Russia? Well, you know, I'm asking what's the best scenario for Russia? Well, you know, I'm asking what's uh, interval uh, than uh, instabilities that we face so right now. So can we move on? Because we, we, we very, quick, very quickly. Very quick. Uh, very follow quickly. Up. I mean, Russia <coughs> has been, um, I mean, the latest revision is that Russia will contract this year about 5%. That's what IMF thinks. Yeah, IMF's uh, projections. Now, assume that the oil prices stay low, you know, for uh, several years. I mean, I don't know if at yeah. current levels, but I mean, <coughs> What is the what is the way out for Russia? I mean, what does it need to happen? Well, to let's not let's not get into a debate to... on the Russian economy too much because we want to keep it back no, no, on volatility. No, no, no. But so I just wanted to because we, we don't have that long left. I just wanted to get a sense of, in your view, who the winners and losers are from the volatility that we've seen in currencies and in uh, the oil markets, um, and particularly who might be um, the winners and losers going forward. Uh, for, uh, I think for China uh, and for many uh, uh, countries, uh, lower oil price uh, and uh, the other lower commodity uh, prices, uh, I think it's a, 
uh, it's, a, it's a positive for picking up uh, higher uh, GDP growth rate and create uh, a little bit more jobs. Uh, but certainly, we hope that uh, uh, that uh, the international supply demand relationship sh should be uh, sustainable. For the financial market volatility, I think that's very different. Uh, that's uh, uh, the currency, uh, the stock market, uh, the commodity futures. I think that's uh, uh, that's different uh, from country to country and from sector to sectors, uh, and different uh, uh, fr uh, from uh, uh, the specific uh, market participants. And when it comes to the financial markets, is China quite? Um, separated from the rest of the world, or does it face contagion? I mean, we've seen contagion in the past from Mexico, from Russia, um, <clears throat> and there is a tendency when assets move in very volatile ways that that spreads to other assets. Is China affected by it's, those moves? Uh, 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 10 years ago, or 15 years ago, when uh, the Asia outbreak, uh, the Asia financial crisis, I, I, I think at that time, uh, Chinese uh, financial market uh, are to some extent isolated from uh, the rest of the world. Uh, but now I think it's, uh, it's uh, closer and closer uh, interlinked, especially, uh, you know, that's, uh, in, in, in the last year, uh, uh, there is a reform uh, to uh, have a linkage between Shanghai Stock Exchange and Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Uh, there are many other uh, developments that uh, Chinese uh, 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 money market, uh, interbank market, uh, commodity market uh, are close, are link uh, uh, closer and closer to international. So it's more market. open to international yeah, volatility. Yeah. Professor Rogoff, what's your sense on um, the, the the positives from volatility? I mean, are we going to see some people benefit significantly from this? <laughs> Probably some people here at Davos, <laughs> but uh, you know, we we certainly the oil price fall. I think has a huge boon for China, for Europe, for Japan, for the United States, and obviously it's hard on the oil exporting countries. I think the exchange rate movement's been a positive thing. Euro, the euro needed to devalue. I think it needs to devalue more. Uh, the yen, you know, it's very helpful. It might not be enough, but if you ask, you know, we've been moving in the right direction or exchange rates moving away from equilibrium. Uh, you know, I think at least you know in the near term, it's 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 a positive. It's not how long does it take to feed through? I mean, people have talked about the yeah. the benefit of oil prices for Europe, for example. I mean, how long will that sh take to show through in the numbers? You know, so uh, it it goes through fastest in the United States because of you know, the taxes yeah. and stuff. Yeah. So in a place like Europe, the government you know gets some of the benefit because the tax rates are so high, the multipliers are high, but then. The governments are up against it, so presumably they'll spend some of it. I think it'll be pretty big within the year, within this year. It'll be, I think, a factor people are underestimating and how much it will help. Okay. Uh, and just when it comes to, to markets, one thing we haven't really talked about a lot is stocks. Um, volatility has been very, very low, particularly in the U.S. market, for a long time. It's ticked up a little bit recently, but a lot of that has been based on you know, very low interest rates, quantitative easing, and other things. Do you see that changing significantly? Well, I, and actually, I, you can mention I mean, government bond again. In government bonds, volatility has been very low too. I mean, are those going to shift as you look out over the next year or so? See, see I, I personally don't think so. Because I think the low rates are with us longer than we could ever expect. Uh, if the Federal Reserve raises rates and puts it at a 25 basis point overnight rate, it's not going to have a dramatic negative effect on the stock market. Um, and so, because that's a meaningless thing, frankly, as it relates to the long term trend of the market. Um, so, my predilection and my prediction is that the markets, particularly the U.S. market, will be higher by this time next year as a result of where the rates are around the world. But you're asking about winners and losers. Uh, the people that are going to win over the next three years is the world's middle class. And that's the big irony of the whole thing because we're having a huge debate about the 99 percent versus the 1 percent. But as investments start to return to the world and as growth starts to return, uh, that debate is going to go down because, you see, what, what ended up happening with the monetary, the consequence of the monetary policy uh, was it was a reflation trade, Thorold. And so what ended up happening was if you had assets, uh, the Federal Reserve and other central banks were trying to reflate those assets to calm down the financial anxiety in the so, so world. Come, so explain that. So why, that. Why does volatility help the middle class? Could you explain that a bit more? Be, because we're, we're going into a transitionary period now where we're normalizing monetary policy. It's creating some volatility near term, 
but what it will ultimately lead to is a more normalization of the capital structure, which means there'll be more investing. I'm predicting greater than expected uh, global investing, which will lead to greater than expected global growth, which will benefit the world's middle class. Uh, uh, and, and frankly, if we're going to be very candid, 50 years from now, someone will say the monetary policy worked to stop the crisis, uh, but it had the unintended uh, effect. The side effect was uh, that it frayed the social fabric of the West. Uh, the rich got very, very rich during that period of time, uh, and the wages stagnated. And I predict that that's going to change, uh, and most people are not predicting that. Uh, but you can just see why it would change because of the cash reserves that have been built up around the world prepared to now reinvest again. That's interesting. We've actually got 10 minutes left, so I'd love to throw this open to questions if anyone has one from the audience. Is there a microphone here in the front, please? Thank you. I have a question for Governor Zhou. Uh, would you please elaborate a little bit on the uh, uh, impact of lower uh, oil, oil prices to the uh, macroeconomy in China in 2015, and also its impact on the possible uh, reform agenda, especially in the uh, energy sector? And also, I'm, I'm also wondering if... Can uh, we stick uh, with those two for the time being, please? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, 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 as I said, that's... Uh, uh, Chinese, China uh, is as a, a, a big uh, uh, importer of the oil uh, and the gas. So I think lower oil and gas price uh, give uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, more momentum for GDP growth rates and the job creation. Uh, so I think in this regard, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, but however, China is also in a period of uh, structural change uh, which strongly calls for the new investment uh, to uh, the non-fossil energy, especially the wind farms, uh, the solar energies, uh, the, the other kind of the hydro nuclear energies. So, so uh, I think we worry a little bit that uh, uh, that's, uh, the price signal uh, may uh, give uh, the disincentive for the new energy types to, to develop and to reduce the new investment into the non-fossil uh, energy. Uh, so uh, actually we hope that uh, uh, the global uh, commodity price uh, should be uh, stable and uh, reasonable uh, and uh, uh, yeah, should be sustainable. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, a very uh, confused signal uh, to create the volatility and also the volatility in the investment directions. And on the reform agenda? Uh, Uh, and also, will lower uh, oil price help China to achieve a 7% economic growth target uh, next year? And also, uh, very quickly... No, to... no, just oh, stick with 7%. Uh, uh, Quick actually, answer to that. Actually, that's, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, Congress uh, hold in this March is going to discuss uh, uh, this uh, uh, target, uh, GDP growth rates, the inflation target, or the others. Uh, but I think uh, basically uh, uh, People's Bank of China is confident that uh, uh, Chinese uh, economy basically is uh, still uh, stable and uh, to have a relatively high growth rate. Meanwhile, we emphasize more on the structural reform. Uh, so basically, I, I'm, uh, I can still uh, optimistic. Great, thank you. Here, yeah, thank you. I just want to probe on the question of central bank communication, perhaps for Governor Zhou and Governor Ortiz. Um, the reason that Switzerland uh, doesn't want to communicate is that the, uh, it probably rightly worried that the market will bet against the decision if it pre-announce it, um, which is indeed the case uh, with uh, the Fed withdrawal from the initial intention of withdrawal the QE back in 2013. I know PBOC is kind of also communicating very grudgingly, sometimes waiting for the media or the market to uh, get the information and then announce its policies. I'm just wondering, uh, is this the real reason that PBOC or other central banks really don't want to communicate that intensively? Uh, uh, I think it's a very complicated uh, question, but uh, for different central banks, uh, you know that it's, uh, the dependence on the public uh, communication are, are on the different level. 
for example, if uh, the economy got into zero lower bound, uh, so you, there is already no rooms for further uh, easing uh, or lower down uh, the interest rates. So surely that's, uh, you may have a, a more of a older uh, expression and try to uh, have a so-called uh, the voice guidance. Uh, so the, uh, the public com communication uh, is very important. Uh, but the, uh, in the other uh, normal situation, uh, sometimes it's equivalent whether you, you, you just announce the policy change or you, 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 you have a, 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 a lot of explanations. Uh, basically, the central bank explanation of a policy change or countercyclic adjustment uh, probably the same as the public opinion expressed, uh, uh, the same as those of major economists comment on that. So in, in that kind of situation, uh, that's the dependence on the, on the communication uh, uh, should be, uh, yeah, you know that's uh, different from country to country. I think comment on that, so when you have a policy changes, it's very sensitive. It, it can be a, a, a big speculations and to cause a big scandals. Uh, that's if you, uh, you try to have early communications. Uh, like uh, the case you mentioned, that uh, Swiss Bank, uh, you know, have uh, a policy change on that. Mm -hmm. So, can we have a question for uh, on markets, if there is one? It's nearly on market. It's more to uh, Governor Zhao. It's uh, he's been prone to <coughs> opening up the Remimbi, and I was wondering his view. Now we see the CNH and CNY more or less at parity. Is it a sign that uh, China is opening up? And last year we saw volatility also in the Remimbi, the first year that has been weaker. Uh, uh, this is uh, another big topic. I don't, don't know whether well, we, we have a time I don't or think not. We have, can we have, um, I think we probably have time for two more questions. Um, mm. And uh, Governor Joe has been very kind, but maybe for one of the other panelists at this point. At the back there. May I ask a simple question? China did so much, you know, investing in infrastructure. When Europe and US will start investment in infrastructure, because it will help you know, tremendously you know, through this crisis. Well, I'd say, of course, it would help tremendously. Um, it's not as easy to organize it. It's not just a matter of the financing, uh, getting the right of way. You know, if you want to change the electric grid, which we do, it passes through many plates. Amtrak the train. We want to put in a faster train. Every state has to approve it along the way. So that, that's certainly an obstacle. But, but uh, yes, um, President Obama proposed an infrastructure bank at one point, which probably got all the traction that his proposals last night will get. But I think it was a good idea to try to provide a framework for making these <laughs> communications. Thank you. One final question, if there is one. Here in the middle. Thanks. Um, I have a question for all the panelists. Uh, is that uh, for uh, in 2014, the Americans' GDP growth has been to the up five percent? Can you speak up? Can you hear me? Hello. Keep going. Lander. Yep, we can yeah. hear. <laughs> Sorry. So it's just about uh, that for China has been in this last so many years been keeping as uh, the uh, engine for the world economy. While well, you think in the next few years this uh, position will be replaced by America? Yeah, there's a question for all the panelists. Uh, sure. <laughs> well, I think that the, uh, the slowdown in China will have a, a huge material influence not only um, in markets, in commodity prices, and so on, but on the, uh, for example, in Latin America, we haven't talked about Latin America, you know, and uh, Latin American growth was uh, propelled uh, in the few years prior to the crisis, basically by China's uh, demand of commodities and so on. So yes, it's going to have, a, I think, a quite dampening effect particularly in Latin America, in Africa, and, and in some place of Asia. And on the flip side, Anthony, what does the, the resurgence of the US mean? Well, I, I think it's complementary. I don't think it's necessarily going to replace China. 
Uh, but I think what we will see is uh, mm -hmm. uh, China and the United States, if we manage that relationship as well as I think we're capable of managing it, uh, those two economic superpowers can lead the world to a, uh, a growth resurgence. So I do, I do think that that's going to happen. Uh, and I don't think that a lot of people are predicting that right now because we're thinking about this very low deflationary environment. But the Chinese and the United States have a huge opportunity to uh, lead the world economically in the next decade. And the, the Russian perspective? Well, I think that uh, uh, it is very important for China to continue leading the economy. And uh, we all benefit when China uh, does it. Uh, probably with American growth, it, 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 it is more uh, at the expense of other countries sometimes. Uh, rather than uh, adds to uh, adds to the global uh, growth, especially uh, it is uh, unfortunately against the European uh, growth uh, sometimes, and uh, European economy is uh, con continues to slide when um, United uh, U.S. economy uh, goes up. Uh, so we need to find ways, and this is about uh, I think global dialogue and uh, some of the platforms that have been created, the uh, Asian Pacific region, um, uh, free trade zones, and things like that, uh, to uh, have American or Ch uh, Chinese growth positively influence uh, growth in other countries. We need to find uh, uh, ways to agree on some of those things uh, to produce global growth. Uh, for Chinese economy, uh, we also use uh, the, the word you, you used in the beginning, the new normal. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, when China uh, found out that uh, the old passion, uh, the pattern of economic development become more and more unsustainable, uh, and uh, uh, environment unfriendly. So we must make a change. So uh, if ch ch Chinese economy slow down a bit, but meanwhile more sustainable, uh, it's for the medium and long term. I think that's a, a good news. Uh, it has good things. It's a, it's a, it's a concept uh, in the uh, in the new normal. Uh, on the other hand, is that. Uh, 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 if uh, the government pursue too high uh, uh, growth rates, it may ignore uh, or postpone those of necessary structural uh, reform. Uh, and now I think that uh, people care more about uh, structural reform, uh, which uh, I think uh, as a substitute that uh, we w would like to su su uh, sacrifice uh, that's a little bit uh, lower uh, growth rate with uh, a stronger a structural reform. Lower growth rate meaning what? Uh, meaning? Meaning what level? Uh, that's, I think uh, that's uh, for, the, for the March of uh, People's Congress uh, uh, to announce. <laughs> I had to ask the question. And so that, that leaves the final word to Professor Rogoff in terms of uh, this, this resurgence of the US, slowdown in China, and obviously Europe still stuck at a pretty low gear in the middle. What is your sense of how that, how that plays? Well, I actually think what will happen is the rest of the world will recover over time, that these things don't last forever. There are other places uh, doing well. India is doing better. UK is doing better. And uh, if China stays strong, I think the you know, global growth will gradually pick up. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for all of our panelists, and thank you all for attending.